of uh, our exciting time here. A couple things before I get started for today. Um, just a couple of announcements. We are, so we're, I, I suppose, right in the middle of assignment three. We've got assignment three coming in on uh, Tuesday, tomorrow, with the usual kind of late policy. After that, so just a quick kind of timeline for you for the next couple of weeks. We'll, we have assignment four going out uh, soon after. Come, and that will be coming in the following Tuesday. So that's Tuesday of week six. And then on the horizon is our midterm, which will be on uh, May 6th. That's going to be the, the Friday of week six. So um, a quick kind of, yeah, so, the, so the, the deal with the midterm in terms of um, coverage, we will post a practice exam at the end of the week. And so we'll give you kind of, which will give you a sense of what the format for the exam is and, and all that. The coverage for the exam will be everything up to and including floats. So that includes sort of the first half of this lecture or so, as well as this week's lab and assignments through assignment four. We'll be starting on assembly today, and that material will not be covered on the midterm. Uh, it is nevertheless. Uh, discouraged that you zone out once we get past the float stuff because the assembly, there's quite a bit of uh, material for assembly that we'll be talking about for the next couple of weeks. And uh, certainly right after the midterm, we'll be jumping right in with, um, with, with assembly. So uh, sort of keeping on top of that is, is going to be the way to go. Okay. And um, SCPD students, you should have received an email from us uh, over the weekend with, inf with information about how your exam process is going to go down. So um, if you have not, make sure you get in touch with us. Cool? All right. So let's get into it uh, for today. Uh, the first part of today, I want to finish up our discussion of floating point. Um, and, then I, and then we'll switch gears entirely and start talking about assembly language. Now, last time I spent uh, the entire lecture pretty much going through lots and lots of details about floats. And we saw lots of examples and a lot of bit patterns. And maybe it was easy to get kind of lost in all the special cases and kind of the issues that came up when representing floats. Today, there are a couple of details that I still need to make sure we, we cover so that you're not, uh, oh, little mouse, uh, make sure we're not kind of lost when you get to lab and the assignment. But I want to spend most of our time kind of looking at floats a little bit bigger picture, thinking about how, as programmers, we can use floats effectively and how to avoid some of the common pitfalls and issues that we've already started seeing. And I'll review, um, I'll review those um, that, that will come up. And so you know, how, do we, how do we work around that? Right. So just to kind of a recap, of what we talked about with floats last time, we introduced this number system, um, uh, the floating point number system, which where the key insight that we had was that rather than representing a number um, is as just a, a single kind of, say, for example, as a decimal number, we split the number into two pieces. Um, one piece was kind of the, the significant figures part, which we called the significand. That would be this kind of one point such and such piece, which we were representing in binary. And then the other piece is the exponent, which was a power of 2, just like with scientific notation, we had a power of 10. And so kind of at a higher level, we can think about the separation here as you can think about this in terms of, um, you can think about the exponent in terms of kind of working with different units of measure. So imagine if I were trying to measure some kind of distance. And I took some, took some measurements and I say, OK, well, the distance I ended up with was 1.5. And that's all I told you. And you'd probably say, well, what does that mean? 1.5 what? What unit are you measuring in? Because it kind of matters, right? Whether I was measuring in nanometers or whether I was measuring in light years, it's going to make a huge, it's going to have a huge impact on the, the magnitude of my number. And so we can kind of think of the exponent as encoding the units that we're in. Um, this sort of, you know, but um, so this sort of 
power of two telling us, are we, should we interpret the 1.5 as 1.5 of something really, really small, or should we interpret it as something really large? And we talked about um, the idea behind this representation is that when I'm talking about a really small unit, when I'm talking about, for example, nanometers, I want a certain amount of accuracy. And I also want a certain amount of accuracy when I'm talking about light years. The level of accuracy we might describe in some, in a kind of relative terms, like, oh, I would like my measurements to be 10% accurate. But realizing that, the, but realize that the, that accuracy of say 10% will actually have a different, abs will be different in absolute terms depending on the units. So say I was measuring something in nanometers, and I said, okay, I've got you know, 1.5 nanometers, and I'm allowing kind of 10% uh, accuracy. So I'm kind of accepting, a, uh, kind of, I'm allowed to be off by maybe plus or minus 0.1 nanometer. And then say that somebody else was measuring something in light years and said, OK, well, I want 10% accuracy on light years. And so I'm willing to be off by plus or minus 0.1 light years. Well, there's a huge difference right, between 0.1 nanometers and 0.1 light years. And both, both of these people want that kind of 10% accuracy. So the idea behind our floating point representation is that when we're representing numbers close to 0, we kind of need to allocate more of our bit patterns um, to these small numbers in order to achieve that 10% accuracy at the nanometer scale. And then when we're kind of out way in the, in the light years range, again, we want the 10% accuracy, but in absolute terms, you know, uh, there's going to be a much, um, there's going to be a much bigger absolute gap between, um, between the two numbers, but we'll still be able to get our level of sort of relative accuracy. Okay. All right. So, um, so a couple of details really quickly before I uh, sort of kind of the main the main points. There was one thing I really kind of promised you, which was how do we represent zero? That was one thing that, that came up. Um, so you'll notice with the the formula that I have here for the value of a float, it's one point x times two to the y, and you'll notice that there's no there's no values that you could substitute for x and y to get zero, right? I can't say one point something times two to the something. I can't get zero from that equation. Um, so we'll need to actually see how we'll need to see a kind of special case that will incidentally allow us to handle zero. Uh, just to recap on the the details of the mini float, which is what I'm going to be focusing on uh, for for this. Uh, recall that the mini float was this made up 8 bit type that does not exist in C. It has one sign bit and four exponent bits, um, three significant bits. Yeah? Okay. So let's see that special case for how to represent zero. So here, um, we, we had said when we first introduced the exponent and we first introduced mini float that we were going to reserve the all zeros exponent and the all ones exponent. And we'll start to see what those are being used for now. When the exponent bits are all zero, we are in the case which we call denormalized numbers. And in, with denormalized numbers, rather than the previous value we had of one point something times two to the something, now we have zero point something. So we, we drop the leading one. So we get zero point whatever times two to the, that happens to be the value. I'll, I'll show you why that is correct in a moment. But notice with this representation that we can now represent zero. If I fill in these three bits with zero, then I get 0, 0.0 times, doesn't matter, so I get zero. You'll also notice that with the, because I have, I'm using a sign bit in this kind of sign and magnitude sort of way that we, we saw last time, if I set the sign bit to one, and then I set the significant to zeros, then I actually end up with negative zero. And so that's, that's just something that is a consequence of this representation. Um, given all the other trade-offs that we're making, having to deal with two zeros is not the worst. And so uh, we'll just kind of 
the, the system will just kind of tolerate the negative zero. It knows that negative zero will compare equal to zero, and everything just kind of gets handled correctly. Um, and now to show you kind of how the D norms fit into the rest of the floating point picture, here's a picture um, that's largely based on the one from the book, and then the number line is also from the, from the book. Um, just showing some of the key points of the, along the sort of float, mini float number line. Uh, we're focusing on positive. So you can see all the way up here, um, the sort of smallest, um, so we're not gonna do negative, so the smallest number, the smallest float we can represent is zero, and then we can go up to the smallest normalized float that we could represent, which is one over 64, or eight out of 512. Um, and then super quick note at the, at the bottom end here, so the, this, the red section where all the exponent bits are one, uh, this section is called the exceptional values. They're used to represent infinity and also nan, which is not a number. Um, you know, they're, they're not, so they don't represent any like finite values. So we just kind of, we just needed a special, we just needed a place to put uh, the kind of the edge case, though, the what do I do if I can't represent this number? If it's sort of not a valid number, you know, the square root of a negative number, what do you get? Well, it's not a number. So that's, that's what we get. Um, we're reserving that for that. Okay. So if the exponent is 0, 0, 0, 0, it becomes a 1 minus bias? Yes, so then the, then the exponent becomes 1 minus bias, that's correct. And you'll notice that that's, so, so, that's, so that's, the, that's an interesting kind of issue here, which is the, the question was, if the exponent bits are all zero, then the exponent in the formula becomes one minus the bias. And you might ask, well, why is that? But you'll notice that if we start at the smallest normalized number right here, um, this eight out of 512, then, and you can, you can verify some of these numbers for yourself if you like, but you'll notice that the, the intention of the denormalized numbers is that we've spaced them equally uh, in increments of one out of 512 to get ourselves up to eight out of 512. So if we had made the exponent anything else, if we had made it, um, if we had changed the, allowed the exponent to go to negative seven, for example, then we wouldn't get this really convenient spacing of one five twelfth intervals up to the smallest normalized number. Okay. Other questions about D norms? Yep. So what's the point of using denormalized numbers? So for one, we do need to represent zero, right? So the question is, all right, do we make a special case for zero and then nothing else? Or do we make a special case for zero and then like, so, all right, so we kind of just need a special case for zero anyway, right? So we're gonna make all bits zero represent zero because if I use the normalized numbers, I can't represent zero. In normalized numbers, everything is one point something, right, times two to the something, and I can't get zero out of that. Neither two to the something nor one point something will equal zero. So I need a special case to represent zero, and I'm gonna put that at all zeros. Now, I end up with these other seven bit patterns, right? Five zeros and then zero, zero, one, up to you know, five zeros and then one, one, one. I've got those seven bit patterns. How should I lay them out? I don't wanna just let them, just throw them away. That seems like a huge waste. So I notice that the smallest number that kind of uses our normalized system is eight out of 512. Well, it seems only logical to then put these seven bit patterns equally spaced from zero up to eight out of 512. And so starting with the special case of setting aside zero, now we're just gonna kind of fill in the other bit patterns to represent sort of something, right? And that's kind of maybe the best we can do. Um, once you get into the D norms, you're, you're kind of hitting the lower end of what you're able to represent anyway, so maybe we don't, you know, um, yeah. Yep. It's not allowed to be something other than zero. Uh, why are the exponent, what do you mean? Like, the exponent bits are all zero for denormalized numbers. Yeah. 
Why is that? Well, so, so why is the exponent bits all zero for, for D norms? So we set aside the all zeros exponent for this special case. In all the other cases where I had the exponent of not all zeros, then I used the other formula, the one point x times 2 to the y. Right? So um, if the exponent bits end up being anything other than zeros, we just use a different formula. We basically think of d norms as just this big special case. When the exponent bits are zero, we just have to handle it specially, and it gives us all these nice properties. OK? Anything else? So the big thing to take away from this chart is just to try to, uh, to see that high-level discussion that I was giving earlier about different units and the, the sort of the relative accuracy at each unit. So you'll notice that when I'm down kind of at this sort of the lower end of, um, of the table, where I'm representing numbers that are kind of fractions of 5 twelfths, you'll notice that neighboring bit patterns are 1 5 twelfth apart. And you'll notice that out here at the kind of extreme end, where um, with the highest values, the neighboring uh, floats, mini floats, are a whole 16 apart. But notice that no matter where I am on the table, I can, I can describe the, the, uh, the gap between neighboring floats, the, the epsilon, if you will, um, as 1 eighth times the exponent. So here again, think of exponent as kind of like units. Down here, I'm kind of in the, what is that, like the sort of almost centimeter kind of scale, right? The almost like one in, one, in 60, 1 in 64. That out here, I can represent gaps of 1 eighth of a, think of like almost a centimeter. Whereas out here, I can represent 1 eighth of a, you know, of a meter or, or of, a, of, a, of this exponent, of this unit. And so the, the relative error that we're seeing in this chart is always 1 eighth of the exponent. Whereas the, although the absolute error is actually going to vary quite wildly from 1 over 512 out to 16. Right. OK? So uh, I won't go into the, the details of how to do floating point arithmetic, but just kind of, just to give you a sense of how uh, the math kind of works out. You can think of doing math with floating point as doing math in scientific notation. So for example, if I wanted to do multiplication, then I would add the two exponents together because that's the, those are the power laws that I learned about um, in, in high school, perhaps. Uh, and then in addition, then, so you can think about, so with the addition case, we might think about, all right, well, what do we do if I want to add a kilometer to a millimeter? How do I add those two? Well, I got to convert them to the same unit at some point. So should I convert to kilometers or should I convert to millimeters? Um, well, the answer is going to come out to be some kind of kilometer, right? So if I've got one, one kilometer and I add a millimeter, the answer is going to be one point something kilometers. So seems logical to convert them both to kilometers and add them up. And so that's, what we're, that's what's going to happen when we do floating point addition. We'll convert. Uh, the sort of the smaller, if, if the exponents differ, we'll convert to the larger exponent and we'll add them. Um, yep. Is that done with bit shifting? By chance? Is that done with bit shifting? The yes. question, so <laughs> how, how do we do the conversion? <laughs> Roughly speaking, yes. Um, okay. I won't, yeah. So you can try to write a floating point adder in C. It's going to kind of suck. Um, so the, it's done with hardware. Um, but the kind of conceptually, yes. You can think of shifting all the bits over to kind of line up the, the decimal points or the binary points. Absolutely. But then if we do this addition, so think back to that example. I got a kilometer and I added a millimeter. Is the millimeter going to make a difference to the final answer? Um, well, that depends on how accurate I'm able to represent my numbers, how accurately I can represent these. So I have an example to show, to show you this. Um, here I've defined a couple of a couple of values. I have a trillion and I have a thousand. And I'm going to try to add up, I'm going to try to get to the same answer a couple different ways. First, 
I take a trillion and I add a thousand and then I subtract the trillion back out. And then in the other case, I add the trillion, subtract the trillion back out immediately, and then add the thousand. Now, if you're a pure mathematician, you say, hey, these two have the same result because I'm allowed to add and subtract numbers kind of in whatever order I want. Um, I can kind of flip the orders around and everything's going to kind of, I should get to the same answer in the end. But does that happen with floats? It turns out the answer is no. And so what happened here? Let's walk through this first one. Floats are just going to get added from left to right. So what's going to happen is I, had, I started with a trillion, right? So think of that as you know, a terameter or a whatever. But um, I started with a trillion, and I added 1,000. Is that going to make a dent in my trillion? Is that going to be enough of a dent that I will notice um, sort of the, the relative change of the number? The answer for floats is no, it is not. So what we end up with when we take a trillion plus 1,000 is we just get a trillion again. And then when I subtract back a tr out a trillion, I am just left with zero. Right. In, in contrast, if I add and subtract the trillion first, I'm left with zero, so then I can add the thousand back in. So again, the idea, going back to what we just talked about with, with relative error, um, that's going to come up not just in how we represent the numbers, but also when we do the math. If the relative change of this thousand isn't enough to make a meaningful dent in my trillion, then it's going to get lost. All right. And then one other, oops, I keep forgetting to do that. Let me do it. Um, I kind of minimized the window. So here, um, and then one other example, uh, I'll let you kind of work out the, uh, I, I do a little bit, bit flipping here, um, just a little bit trick here. And what I'm trying to get at, so with the table that we saw last time, with this table that we saw on the slide, we saw that the difference, we saw that the difference between the, I guess it's not super readable, so that's fine. Um, we saw that the difference between the largest and the next largest floats was 16. And now we're not in mini float anymore. Right? We're in our, our standard C 32-bit float. And so we might ask, well, what is the difference now between the maximum representable float, so that's, that's not infinity, right, um, and its neighbor? You know, is it, is it 16? Is it 1,000? Is it a billion? Let's, let's find out. Uh, I didn't save. All right, here we go. That's the difference between the largest representable float, float max, and its nearest neighbor. That's a huge difference, right? That's like 10 to the 30. That's kind of crazy. So what's up with that? How are we making all these arguments about kind of, you know, error and stuff? Like, if my error is that much, like, who is OK with an error of that much? Well, it turns out. Relatively speaking, this isn't actually so bad. We're already representing numbers with 38 zeros, right? Or like 38 digits. And so if we just look at the kind of relative change between this number, float max, um, and, and its neighbor, we're already getting quite a good, we're getting quite good accuracy. We're getting something like what, you know, point, I don't know, five zeros and a one percent? Are four zeros and a one, that's pretty good, right? Relatively speaking, this number is not that big compared to these numbers. Although in absolute terms, the difference is huge. And so we're going to keep coming back to that over and over in lab and in assignment, that it's not about the absolute differences between our numbers, it's really about the relative difference, depending on, we got to ask ourselves, what unit are we working in? Oh, you're working in a unit that ha that's, you know, 10 to the 38 meters, okay, then I guess you can tolerate a difference of 10 to the 30 meters. Okay. Any questions about this? Question. Yep. So there's a question 
to when I wanted to compare two doubles for equality. Yeah. And I kept getting this compiler warning. Yeah. This, uh, which makes sense, but yeah. like, is it really bad style to just cast them both as like unsigned bits in that case? Ah, so the question is, if I want to compare two, uh, two floats for equality, we got a compiler error or a compiler warning. Is it bad style to cast them and just compare bits? Um, the answer is generally yes, especially because casting to unsigned int is actually, you got to get it, you got to be very careful about how you cast it, or else you might actually get the number converted. Um, that's something you'll, you'll look at in, in lab a little bit. But um, the, the, the intention of the compiler warning that some of you may have already seen in assignment two is, we can't really ask for exactly equals when it comes to floats, and this is maybe goes to our, our kind of the big picture summary here. Um, we can't ask for things like are two floats exactly equal because issues like how we represented, you know, the representation error. We can't exactly represent 0.01. We can't exactly represent 0.2. So what does it really mean for two floats to be equal? Is that um, generally speaking, you don't really want to compare for absolute equality. Um, and we'll see what some of the alternatives are instead. That's going to be part of your assignment, actually. Um, so sort of beyond the stylistic thing, usually comparing floats for equality can lead to some pretty wacky behaviors. And so the, that's what the compiler is trying to trip you, uh, you know, to draw your attention to. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to do something instead, and we'll explore that. Um, of how do I compare two floats to see if they are close enough, to see if this relative error is within my acceptable kind of accuracy. And that's, so that's what we should be thinking about doing instead of asking for double equals. Other question? All right, so hopefully that kind of gives you just a little sort of a big picture summary of floats. I know that we kind of mixed the big picture and the details. And so in lab, you'll see kind of both of those. You'll see how do we, you know, reason about floats as programmers? How do we think about, you know, dealing with relative and absolute error and issues with how we represent numbers? And then we'll also see a little bit of the bit pattern stuff as a way of kind of precisely quantifying that error. I think it's really tempting for programmers who don't learn about floats to just think, oh, yeah, well, I, you know, I learned that floats aren't exactly representable. So whenever I run into some issue, I'm just going to add a few zeros and everything will hopefully work out. Maybe I just go to double. Maybe I do some other, you know, do some other like random trick that hopefully will deal with the error. But what we're hoping to, to kind of get at here is that we can precisely identify what that error is. How, ex how much will the two values differ? And you know, what are the things that we can do to account for that? For example, reordering our arithmetic is something that we could do that will, at least in the case that I showed you there, totally handle, um, totally solve that one particular problem. So we can, we can think about, we can reason about the error, and we can reason about the problems very precisely, and, and that's why we spend our time looking at the details and looking at the bit patterns. OK? All right. So now I'm going to switch gears entirely and talk about uh, a, something so totally different. We've talked for the last week and a half about how to represent data. We saw how we're going to represent integers, how to represent floats. I gave you this kind of one slide about representing characters. There's one more thing that we might be interested in representing. Um, basically, everything, all forms of data, you think about like pointers and uh, structs and all that, they all kind of fit into that category, I'm representing some combination of integers and characters and floats, um, some kind of number. Um, and, but there's one other thing that we want to be able to represent, and that is our code. So what does it mean to, you know, what does it mean when I type make and I am handed a, you know, I get this binary, you know, maybe I'll, I'll show it in over here a little bit. What does it mean when I have this floats binary that I can run, this program that I can run that executes and does this stuff? And maybe by accident you may have uh, opened up one of these executables in an editor and been like, ah, uh, Oh, I guess that's what it means. Cool. All right, I'm done. I don't, I don't want to deal with this anymore. But what's kind of interesting, if we kind of go down a little, you can see some, some remnants of data, right? We can see that we've got some characters in here. And, uh, you know, scattered throughout, we've got all these wacky bits and 
things and all that. There's your bunch of junk. Somewhere in here is our code. And it is our code encoded, you know, written in a, in a way that the machine can understand. So that it can execute it and it can kind of, it can, yeah, and sort of carry out the operations that we wanted. And what we're interested in is how exactly that process works. So the key here, the first key takeaway point here is that when I type make and when make runs a compiler, our C code is turned into a, is ultimately turned into a machine representable, or sorry, a, a representation which we call machine code, which our hardware, our physical computers can actually read and execute. The C code itself is not executed. And in fact, there is kind of a fair distance between the instructions, the, the lines of C code, and the, um, and the actual individual machine instructions that are executed. C is about as close as we're going to get. If we use something like C++, the distance would be even larger um, between the code that we wrote and the code that runs on the machine. C is convenient in the sense that the, the connections will be fairly obvious as we go on. And so what we want to do is we want to study what it means to go from C to this machine code. Now, as it turns out, reading the binary machine code is rough and it's just not going to happen. No one does that. Um, so what we'll do is we'll spend our time one level above that, one level before that, looking at what is called assembly language. So here we will have individual instructions that are being executed on the machine, but they will not look like lines of C code. They'll be, you know, they'll be very explicitly do this, you know, telling the machine do this and then do this and then you know, here's the next step and then you know, go to this location in code and start running this code. Um, but it will be a little bit more readable than reading off zeros and ones, which nobody does. And you might say, all right, so sure, fine, but why? Right? Why are we studying assembly language? Um, now, if your aspiration is to become the most awesome compiler writer in the world, you don't need a justification. If you want to be the person you know, or participating in that group of people who are translating C to the machine, uh, the machine code, then of course you need to learn um, how that translation happens and you need to learn about assembly. But most of us aren't that, right? Most of us are, 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 are happy that somebody else did that work so we don't have to. Um, so what's the point? Chances are you won't find yourself having to hand generate assembly. That's not really a thing. Sometimes it is, though. Uh, there are, especially as devices get smaller, there are a lot of instances of custom, very customized hardware or really, really sort of limited environments. These are usually called embedded systems. You can think about like the, the code that runs inside of a car or inside of a, inside of like a wireless router, these kind of little devices that um, are trying to do, like that have software running in them. Sometimes we can write them in C, hopefully we can, but there are cases where we would need to write some assembly. So that, that could come up. But mostly, our focus in this class is going to be on reading assembly. And it's going to be on thinking about how we can translate from C to assembly and back again. And what we get from that is, for one, we can kind of understand what the compiler is doing, which is sort of just a, just kind of a, you know, a really useful thing to know. What is the compiler doing to my code? Is it generating the code exactly as I wrote it? And we will find out in a few weeks the answer is no, not at all. There are things that you know, we write out that the compiler says, oh no, I don't have to do that. I can do it a, a different way that will be more efficient. Whereas there are also things that, but then there are also things that the compiler can't recognize. And some of you may have run into this already with assignment one, where you know, on the efficiency advice, we said, by the way, if you have a call to Sterlen inside of your loop, 
it might help you, it might help your, pro your program run a lot faster if you pull that Sterlin out of the loop. That's something that you might think, well, couldn't the compiler figure that out if, if we know that that's faster? And it turns out that for various reasons, the compiler cannot. And so by studying how to read assembly, we will be able to kind of reason about that. We'll be able to say, aha, I notice here that the compiler was not able to perform this optimization. And when I do that optimization myself, my program is going to run way faster. Um, or we'll be able to say, oh, OK, here's a place where the compiler did do an optimization. So I was worried that, you know, maybe I should, I was worried that I, I didn't want to use all these magic numbers and these bit, uh, these bit operations because I was worried that my program would run slower. But as it turns out, the compiler was way ahead of me on that. And that I can write my code in a purely, you know, a very readable way. And I can still get all the performance benefits. So we can kind of have those discussions about what is the compiler doing, what is it that we can do, and, and when is it that making a change in C will actually have an impact on the code that will run on the machine. Okay? All right, so uh, the first, now, so before I can get into exactly learning about the assembly language that we are using, I need to introduce a terminology, just to kind of a little bit of, a little bit of EE, I guess. Um, and I need to tell you about what an ISA is. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn about a very specific set of assembly instructions, a very particular, a very specific machine. And that is the machine that our myth machines are, that is the, the architecture that our myth machines are, and that most desktops, laptops, and servers run on. And the, the technical term for one of these architectures, one of these families of machines, is an ISA. Uh, ISA standing for Instruction Set Architecture. And what, what happens here is you can think about kind of what has to happen to make, to make the entire sort of stack work, to make from this C code, you know, write, um, compile down into assembly, that, compiled to that gets turned into machine code that runs on our hardware, what needs to happen? Well, a lot of people need to be in agreement on how the machine's going to work. And that agreement comes in the form of this big document. The ISA is essentially just a huge document um, that you can think of this as sort of the contract between the people designing the hardware, so in this case, you know, Intel or AMD, and the compiler writer, and also a little bit of the programmer. And what the ISA is going to tell us is, what are the things that this hardware, this particular machine, this particular chip is able to do? It'll say, OK, well, you know, here's how it can access memory. And here are the arithmetic operations it can do. And here are the ways that it can move around your code, the kind of control flow. These operations are going to be much more limited than operations you might be used to in C. You're going to get a little bit of addition. You get a little bit of maybe some multiplication. Sometimes you, you'll get division if you're lucky. Um, some ISAs provide division and some don't. Uh, maybe you'll get some bit, bitwise operations, but it's definitely nothing even advanced as you know, any of those C expressions. It's just mostly kind of one operation at a time. Add these two numbers, subtract these two numbers, multiply these two numbers. And in terms of these sort of control flow, we're not getting if then else, we're not getting for loops, we're kind of getting after you do that, jump over to this piece of code and start running that. OK, now jump back to this piece of code and start running that. The other thing that the ISA gives us is it sort of gives us some, just tells us a little bit about how different pieces of our program, different functions, different programs should interact. So it'll tell us things like, when you make a function call, here's where you need to put, so you know we don't get, a call this function with five arguments and here they are instruction, we'll get make a function call as just one instruction. And then the ISA will tell us, all right, well, when I make that function call, where do the parameters have to go? Where does the return value have to go? When I set up memory, when I lay out my memory on the stack, how does that look? What, what is, you know, what are we going to, what goes where? This is all information that is dictated by the ISA. Now, there are going to be some real costs to changing 
the ISA. And that is that every time we rewrite this document, every time we make any change to, um, to this contract, that has a very physical impl implication on the hardware that's getting manufactured, right? So Intel can't just say, oh yeah, you know, here, let me add this instruction, and now suddenly everybody's machine has that instruction. If Intel wanted to add an instruction, they would need to create new processors. They'd need to spend you know, millions of dollars manufacturing the new chips, and then we'd have to spend millions of dollars buying these new chips, and then everybody with the old ones are out of luck. They won't have that instruction. There's a, a fundamental limitation of hardware, right? And sort of as a consequence of that, generally speaking, ISAs don't get smaller. So it's one thing to add an instruction and say, hey, everybody, check this out. Our new generation of processor has this sweet new instruction, and you should all buy it. But it would be a pretty big problem if Intel said, hey, everybody, our new generation of processor, we threw out these 10 instructions. I hope you weren't using them. Because now, any program that was written before that was using them won't work on the new processor anymore. And so generally speaking, the ISA, we're never going to remove stuff. We're never going to change something that was already written in that contract, and we're not taking anything out. And so as these sort of architectures evolve over time, they often get a little more and more and more complicated. And given that the original, so we're, we're the, the processors that we are working on are called x86-64, and given that the original sort of 86, 8086 started in uh, 1978, yeah, so there's been 38 years for stuff to get added and nothing to get removed. And so we're going to be left with a fairly complicated, what is it, like 3,000, 4,000 page document as, uh, at this point for the x86-64 ISA. The good news is uh, you're not expected to learn 4,000 page documents. Um, we actually don't need that much to understand what we're hoping to get out of of, of the translation from C to assembly, we only need a few, a few of the pieces. But, um, but just realizing that you know, the full instruction set is huge. We're talking a few thousand instructions um, because we just kept adding. And then there are gonna be places where I'll introduce something and you'll look at it and say, wow, that's a really wacky name for that. Or that's a really wacky way of describing that. Like the, the instruction is, very, is really bizarre. Why, why is that? And at this point, there, you know, more often than not, I'll, I won't be able to give you a good answer to that. I'll just say, well, it's like that because in 1985, it made sense at the time. Like, 1985, yeah, that was reasonable. That was something you, you did. And now that the system has evolved so much over the last 30 years, we don't, you know, the, the, the names or the idea there isn't quite as relevant, but now we just kind of have to live with with what it was. Okay, so we're, we're gonna do a lot more kind of a, like, here's what it is. Um, there's not gonna be a lot of memorization. We have a sort of a one page sheet of all the kind of things that you need to know about x86-64 on the website. Um, so don't worry about having to memorize all these wacky names and all these silly, weird things, um, but just realize that a lot of them are there for kind of legacy reasons, just because that's how it was back then, and then we just kind of had to inherit it now. Okay, so let me introduce some of the basic components of x86-64, and I'll focus on one particular instruction today, and then we'll kind of broaden our, our scope for next time. The first thing I need to, to tell you is that the model that I was presenting about how your C code executes is actually kind of a lie. So when we talked about executing, when we talked about executing C code, imagine I was talking about executing the, the, a simple line. Imagine I've you know a couple of uh, a couple of integer variables. So they, say they were ints or or whatever type. Doesn't matter what type. Um, and imagine I was executing the line x equals y plus five. Our sort of our so our model of uh, of the way C programs execute is we have x somewhere in memory. And we have y somewhere in memory, you know, on the stack, for example. And so we read the value of y, we add 5 to it, and then we put the value into x. Okay? 
but that's not actually how it's going to be executed on the hardware. The hardware does have a notion of memory, but it can't really do operations directly on memory uh, quite as easily. So in addition to memory, we are going to have these, uh, in x86-64, we have 16 of these. They're called registers. And so each register is going to be just an 8-byte an eight byte box, just like the 8-byte boxes that I was drawing uh, in, you know, in stack diagrams and pointer diagrams, but they are not in memory. They do not have addresses. They just exist right next to the processor itself, and that's where our numbers or our, our values have to go in order for us to do math on them or to do kind of pretty much anything else on them. So in the example of trying to execute x equals y plus 5, what probably actually happens in the hardware is that the first thing we need to do is we need to read y from memory, and we need to put it in one of these registers. And so percent %rax is the name of one of these registers. You're starting to see kind of the wacky name already. Like, what? Why is it rax? OK, back to that in a second. Um, so we're going to read y from memory into one of these registers. Then we can add 5 to it because we can do math on our registers. And then we move that register, the value of that register, back out to uh, x. And so we kind of have this, this multi-step process just to execute a line of C code like this. Yeah? Now I should, just a quick note that some of you may have already run into this while looking in, in GDB at the first couple of assignments. Um, occasionally the compiler can take a little bit of a shortcut. So the model was that all local variables are stored on the stack in memory. Sometimes the compiler realizes that it doesn't need to store the local variables in, on the, in memory at all. And it will decide that it just wants to put the variable directly in a register and not, and not, um, and not use memory at all. And you might have run into this in GDB if you tried to, say, print out the address of some local variable and you got some really weird message like, I can't take the address of that thing. It's in a register. And you, at the time, probably thought, what's a register and why can't you take the address? That doesn't make sense. Isn't everything in memory? You know, so the compiler is going to take a few shortcuts. But this is the, the general model that we're thinking of. And then we'll learn about those shortcuts later. All good? OK. So here's a warm up of the, so here's the, a list of the registers that we have. There are 16 of them. Again, not required to memorize these. They are on the website, so you don't even have to copy them down. Uh, there's, a, there's a CS107 guide to x86-64 that has all these registers and kind of how they're split up. Um, so don't worry about you know, frantically copying all the names down. Um, you can see you know, the names are, are a little wacky. They kind of have these historical meanings that I'm just not even going to go to. Um, and so we, there are, there are uh, seven more that I'm not showing here, but they look kind of like R8. So R9 through R15 kind of work that way. Some of these registers have special meanings. So we'll see, we'll talk about RSP uh, way later uh, in a couple of lectures. But for example, we'll, we'll see a couple of these meanings today. So RAX has a, uh, has a fairly specific meaning. That's where our return value is going to go. I'll get back to that. I'll, sh I'll show you that in, when I actually get into the assembly. Um, and then, you know, so some of these are used for parameters, some of these are used for local variables, and so on. So each register is a 64-bit box. It's an 8-byte, you know, box where I can put stuff in. So it's big enough for a long, it's big enough for a pointer. But sometimes I don't want to store a long. Sometimes I don't want to store a pointer. I just want to store an int, which is 32 bits. So what do I do? Well, it turns out there are these sub-registers. Rather than having 16 completely separate registers for the 32-bit um, you know, pieces, we have these other names, which mostly start with E, except down there, which allow us to refer to the lower four bytes of their corresponding R register. So EAX is the lower four bytes, or 32 bits, of RAX. And then we actually have even more. We've got AX, which is the lower 
two bytes of RAX, and we've got AL, which is the least significant byte of RAX. And this, these subregisters will allow us to represent, you know, will allow us to refer to one byte things, two byte things, four byte things, and eight byte things. And so now we can kind of, you know, we can kind of um, use the sort of size of register that corresponds with the math we're doing. If we're doing math on, math on ints, then we probably use some of these, you know, E uh, registers. And if we're use, doing math on cares, then maybe we use these AL and so on. Okay. All good? All right. So now let me introduce the move instruction. So the first instruction, which is the instruction that we're going to use for the kind of the basis for uh, a lot of our discussion today, is the move instruction. And we already saw that when I showed you the example of x equals y plus 5, we saw that two of the three things that we needed to do were to move something from memory into a register and then move something from a register into memory. And so the move instruction is going to come up a lot. A syntactic note. The order is different than what you might expect from something like a mem copy or an assignment. It's move source destination. And what it's going to do is it's going to copy the source value to the destination. It's not doing an actual move. The source is kind of left there. Um, but we're, we're, we're copying. It allows us to take one value from source and then put it into destination. Okay? And so let me actually just show you some code. Uh, the way we're going to do this, there's this really awesome tool called GCC Explorer. Um, you can follow along if you want. Um, if you want, it's on the syllabus page. Go down to the this this lecture, and there's a link to GCC Explorer, um, and you can use that to sort of try out some of the stuff if you're if you're interested in, in following along with me. Um, but so what I can do is essentially I can write C code on the left here, and then I will get the assembly on the right. And I'll use that to be able to kind of demonstrate in real time some of the some of the things that we're we're talking about. Okay. So let's get into it. Um, I'm going to mostly do a lot of our operations on longs today because longs are eight bytes. They use up the full kind of eight eight byte register, and and we'll talk about what it means to you know do some of the smaller moves in a second. So the first one I want to show you is what happens if I have a function. That just returns negative one. So here on this side, you can see the assembly for this. Couple things to note. So here's the name of the function. There is this ret at the end here, which indicates that we are returning from the function. But notice that ret, unlike in C, doesn't take an argument. We don't say, hey, return this value. That's not how ret works. The ISA says if your function returns a value, then before you call ret, you need to put that value in the register RAX. So here we can see that the, one of the first kind of purposes of one of these registers, RAX is going to, at the end of the function, store the value that we return. So here we're going to try to move negative 1 into RAX. Now all registers start with a percent sign. Um, so you know, that's, that's the indication for we're talking about a register. The dollar sign here means that we are moving a constant value. Um, this is also called an immediate value. Um, so that's all the dollar sign means, is I'm moving the actual value negative 1, not an address, not a, you know, some offset from a register. I'm moving the actual value negative 1 into RAX. And then this Q here, is a suffix on move. So maybe I'll, yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll annotate this um, for the, the code that I'm going to post on the, on the website. I'll annotate this uh, a little bit more with comments explaining each piece. But so we've got, so the base instruction, the, the main instruction is move. We want to move one thing from one thing to another thing. And this Q says, I want to move 64 bits. So there's a list of suffixes that we'll get to in a second, mostly. Um, for now, since I'm doing all moves in terms of 64 bits, uh, move Q means move 64 bits from where? Well, from the constant value negative 1 into the register RAX. Questions about that? Okay. 
So then, ret means return. Um, but it's not return like return in C. It means, okay, I'm going to return this function. We will go into all the details about how call and return works later. Um, but you'll just see that at the end of every function, we will call ret, which means return. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So now let's see a few other variants of move. So there are, are lots of different ways that we're going to be able to use the move instruction. Um, and so we'll see a few, of another variant now. And this one I'll call reg. I'll have this one actually take a per, this function take a parameter, and I'll have it return the parameter itself. So all this function does takes a parameter, returns it. Both are of type long, and here you can see what we do here. There's still a move queue, so we're still moving 64 bits. We're still moving it into eax or sorry rax for our return value, but we are moving from the register RDI now. So what does this tell us? It tells us that RDI is the location, is the register where our first parameter is going to go. So this instruction, if we had to think about what it meant at a high level, it says move the first parameter value into the return value. So we're moving from RDI into RAX, which means we take the first parameter and we set that as our return value. And then we call red. Okay? Um, yep. Uh, I noticed that uh, if you have a second parameter and you return that instead, yep. that it moves from RSI instead. Yes. But since it's only uh, like, what, like 16 different processor slots, yeah. what happens if you have like a 17 parameter? Yeah. Function? Yeah. So the, so the question is in terms of adding more parameters. So if we add another parameter, then there's another register for that, which happens to be RSI. I'll show you that in a second. But so the question is well, what happens if we run out of registers? Right? What happens if I write this crazy, wacky function that I decide that it's a great idea to just have it take like 12 arguments? At some point, they're going to start going into memory. Um, we're not going to have registers for that anymore, and so they'll get written out somewhere else. Um, they'll get written onto the stack. Um, um, yes? Uh, how does a function like fscanf with a variable number of arguments look? Uh -huh. So the question is, how does a function like fscanf, if it has a variable number of arguments, you'll notice with something like fscanf or you know, printf or anything like that, that we, that we, the first argument is always this format string, or I guess the second argument in some cases, is always this format string. And the behavior of those functions depends on how many of those format specifiers I put, the percent %d's and the percent %s's. What's going to happen is that when I call the function, I'm just going to fill however many registers there were arguments. And then the, the function like printf or something will just look at that format string. It knows where the format string is, and it'll look at that and figure out where to read its arguments based on how many format specifiers there are. Um, we'll come back to co function call and return in a second, so if that didn't make sense, don't worry about it. But roughly speaking, there's actually kind of no special handling. Um, we're just going to fill some registers, and the function just has to know um, to read from that register. I should say the compiler, when it compiles the function printf, just has to know to read from those registers. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. So let's see a couple other moves. So those are, those are nice and simple. I can move a, a, a constant value, an immediate. I can move, a, neg I can move a, uh, a register. What if I have a pointer now? I'll call it indirect. Um, and so what if I have a long star PTR? and I return star PTR. So here you can see the indirect, still a move queue, still being moved into uh, RAX, but now notice the difference. It's a very subtle difference, but it's very, very important that I put the parentheses around RDI, and the parentheses in assembly means dereference. It's a bummer that it's not a star, so that it would go like it would align with C, but it's not. When I see parentheses in assembly, that means treat RDI in this case as the address of some location in memory. Go to that location and read eight bytes because I have a move queue and write it into RAX. So most important set of parentheses you're ever going to see in your life. That is a dereference. 
and it is called an indirect address because we're going through a pointer. There is a level of indirection. Oops. Did it actually let me? Wow, did I actually get that wrong in both places? Interesting. So we have that level of indirection represented with parentheses in assembly. Another example. So now imagine if I have an array. And I want to return ARR of 2. So here we see the same idea. We're still dereferencing RDI. But the way to read this is that before dereferencing RDI, we're going to add 16 to it. So this number out in front is going to be added to RDI, the value that's in RDI. And then we will dereference that location and we'll read that value. Now, why is it 16? Well, my array is of type long. Each long has eight bytes, takes up eight bytes of memory. So to calculate the address of array bracket two, I need to start at array and add 16 bytes. In C, we had the automatic scaling. We just wrote two, and the compiler knew that that was two longs. In assembly, we do not get automatic scaling. We have to do the math ourselves. So here, we, can, we get 16 of, um, we add 16. Is that okay? If I change this to a three, we add 24. If I change this to a, you know, oops. Oh, I've, I lost it. That's okay. I don't know what I did. Oh, wow, it indented like crazy. Um, yeah, so I add that. Right, so now we're at, um, now we're at eight. Oh, now we're at 24, because I added, I'm at array three. Okay. Yep. With the percent RDI, does that mean anything? Uh, so the question is, can you put the, parent, the number inside the parentheses? No, that doesn't mean anything. Um, this is just a, this is all just like a lot of syntax, right? Um, here, actually, I want to I want to change it to array one. I want to show you something, but um, yeah, there's just a lot of syntax, and it turns out this is the syntax for how to do uh, RDI plus a number, and then DRF. Let me show you something. Uh, another way I could use uh, the displacement. So at the top there, I have de I've defined a, a struct called fraction has a numerator and a denominator. And imagine if I wanted to return the denominator of that struct, so through a struct pointer. So I take a struct pointer, fraction star f, and I want to return f arrow denominator. Notice that the way we get to that, the way we get to f arrow denominator is still using this displacement. Because with the way the struct is going to be laid out, it's too long. So we've got an eight. We got eight bytes for the numerator. We got eight bytes for the denominator. The way we get to the denominator is we start at the beginning of the struct and we go eight bytes in. That happens to be exactly the same way we get to the first element, you know, bracket one of an array of longs. And in assembly, we cannot tell the difference. So right away, we're starting to get a sense that. Assembly doesn't really have types. There's the concept of sizes, like, you know, RAX is an eight byte thing, but there is no good notion of C types. So you thought it was hard doing math on Voidstar, right? Where you had some Voidstar and you had to cast a Karastar and you had to do the math yourself. Now it's even worse. Now we don't even know half the time what, what type we're looking at. Is RAX? Uh, a long, is it you know, some other type? We, and you know, d is the parameter of type fraction star? Is it long star? Are we, are we doing array indexing? Are we doing struct fields? We don't get any of that information um, because it's just, it's just bytes. We're just moving around in memory. All right, eight bytes here and 12 bytes there, and that's how, we're, that's how we get around. Okay. Questions? Anything? Oops. Okay. All right. 
All right, one more addressing mode. So these, these different variants of how we can access memory are called addressing modes. So one of these is the, the indirect address where we, where we use the parentheses. And this one was in uh, a displacement um, with an indirect with displacement. The last one, which is going to look super scary, is a scaled index. And so what we're going to do there is we're going to take an array and we're going to take an index, call it i, and let's say I want to return array bracket i, I'm just going to do that for now, array bracket i. So this line, you know, just kind of threw everything in there. First thing, rsi is the location of the second parameter. So rdi, or sorry, rsi is the value of the second parameter. So rdi is the array, is arr, rsi is i. We have a call it index. So RSI is index. And what this line does is it says, okay, starting from RDI, so starting from ARR, we're going to add index times 8. Just a, just a syntactic thing, you're just going to have to. You know, it's like I said, you, uh, the, the, all of these, you'll see these on the, on the website, so don't worry about uh, really kind of memorizing every little piece of it. But um, there are some kind of, you know, some basic mechanics that we do need to get down here. Um, so this is saying RDI plus RSI times 8. Question. Yep. If the uh, was like a size T or an int, would the register still be RSI or would it be ESI? Uh, so the question is if... Uh, if if, uh, let's see, sorry, if IDX were not a long, if it were an int, so by the way, size T is a long. Just heads up. Um, yeah, and then um, if, if IDX were an int, is it going to use ESI? I guess we can try it, and maybe I'm going to walk myself into something very bad. Actually, here, let's do this. I'm going to use unsigned. Yeah, no, it's, okay. Uh, it's actually going to take, wow. That's weird. Right, so it's, um, it is actually going to still end up using RSI because that's just kind of how you address stuff. Um, but it's, it does a wacky thing kind of that. Yeah, don't worry about it. Um, but essentially, um, so, so the, the registers in here, are, uh, so the registers in our, uh, in all of these different addressing modes, the registers in parentheses, they're pretty much always going to be R registers because we are talking in terms of, um, we are always talking in terms of 8-byte addresses, so we pretty much want these always to be 8-byte registers. Yeah? Um, now, one little, one extra little detail. Let's imagine that I said I wanted to go to array index my array of index minus one. This is the mo absolute most complicated that you're going to get of an addressing mode. So we have this RDI RSI eight, but we can also throw this negative eight in front. Or we can throw any number in front, just like the displacement. And that's the most complicated addressing mode. We have a displacement, a, we have a displacement, so we have kind of this constant offset. We have a base register, we have an index register, and we have a scale. And that's going to be base plus the offset, which might be negative in this case, plus index times scale. So RDI minus 8 plus RSI times 8. So, uh, yep. Um, what happens if uh, the index is out of bounds? Like if it's negative 1, for example. Oh, good, good. So what if the index is out of bounds? Yeah. Uh, well, you see the instruction there. It's just going to do it. Right? So if RSI is a negative, um, it turns out, you know, we'll do the normal integer arithmetic, RDI plus RSI, that's going to go negative, and now we're going to go before the array. Hope there was something there, or you're psych faulting. Right? And now we can kind of see why there is no bounds checking. Like, part of the reason that there's, we're not going to get any kind of helpful bounds checking. This is actually what's happening in the machine, is we're just doing some, we're just doing some math. Take some number, multiply by 8, add it to the other number, go. 
That's in a different program or something? Yeah, so if we, if we end up, uh, so the question is, would it cause, like, what kind of, what would happen if it were in a different, the address we ended up in it was a different program, then, you know, yeah, we'd probably, we'd, uh, generally different, each program has its own kind of notion of memory. They're actually very separated. Um, but if that memory wasn't mapped at all, um, or if it were, like, um, read-only and we tried to write to it, then, yeah, we'd get various kinds of seg faults. But whatever, every, every kind of seg fault is a sad seg fault, so we don't really want to go there. Um, yeah, so. Um, so yes, there there would be various ways that we could kind of get get tripped up if the memory wasn't there. But to be clear, this is exactly what was happening when you did this in C, right? This is there's not like this isn't like another layer, right? Like what happened was your C code would get translated to this, it gets run on the machine, and whenever you saw a seg fault before, well that this is the instruction that caused the seg fault. So uh, let's see. Now, um, let me show you. Uh, so we could change kind of both sides. I've been I've been focusing on the source operand. So keep in mind, right? The move, the so we've been changing the source. You can see the the first argument is changing. That is where we're moving from. And so let me show you a quick thing about moving to a destination. Um, and so here, imagine if I want to do ARR of IDEX equals ARR of IDEX plus one. Right? So let's say we're trying to shift one element down in an array. Okay. Um, I mentioned this very briefly on the slide, probably, you know, uh, but the issue is you might think, oh, can we take, you know, this piece and then this piece and kind of throw them together into one big move? And the answer is going to be no. We can't have both arguments to move be one of these addressing modes. It cannot be from memory. So what we need to do, this actually mimics exactly what I was saying um, from, the, from the slide of the example. I could probably even do like a quick, well, so where what we do is if I want to do this assignment, I first read the value from memory. I first read array of i plus 1 from memory into RAX, and then now that the value is in RAX, I can take the value in RAX and I can put it out to array of index. Yeah? Everybody good with this? Ah, good question. It, so the question is, isn't RAX reserved for return values? And the answer is, reserved is not the correct term for that. RAX happens to be used for the return value when the function is done. But at any other point throughout the function, it's just another register. We could have used any other register here. We could have used RCX. We could have used RDX, right? But RAX is a pretty common register to use as just kind of like, here's some scratch space. So in this case, it, you know, our function is returning void, so it doesn't matter that we're using RAX because whoever called us isn't expecting a return value. Right? So, so the, the key here is, like, all these registers are just boxes. And so you get to put kind of whatever you want in each box as long as you kind of follow the convention uh, um, you get to follow. You get to put whatever you want in each of these boxes as long as you, um, you know, follow the convention at the end. So I just want to save this so I can get back to it. Okay, here's another. All right, so we've done addressing modes. I'm going to clear this, or else we're going to get a bunch of a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to do something. I'm going to sort of switch switch gears a little bit here, um, and do show you kind of what what all happens. And this is going to go back to, so we already started talking about assembly having no real notion of types. So let me show you that now. So let's do suffixes. I'll call this function suffixes. And it will take, oh, well, yeah. And it'll take, I'll start with a long star PTR. And I want to assign star PTR to zero. This code should look uh, as kind of the usual. So I move Q, 
the constant or the immediate zero, so that's dollar sign zero, into dereference RDI. Right? So I, I treat RDI as a pointer, follow it, write a zero there. All good? But now let's imagine that PTR wasn't a long star, but it was actually an int star. Notice the change, very small change here. We're not using a move Q anymore. Now we're using a move L. So this suffix on move tells us what type we're looking at. Q is 64 bits. L is 32 bits. And we can keep changing this to a short, which is two bytes. And now you can see it's a move W. W is 16 bits. This is all in the, the one pager as well. Um, and then the last one. Here's the... Byte. Okay. So depending on the, the suffix to our move instruction, we get um, the different we get the different, um, we get a different amount of moving. We either move one byte or two bytes or four bytes or eight bytes. And that's the only thing that changes across that. Ah, so the question is, does that put us in the right sub register? At this point, we're not talking about sub registers because we are moving from a constant to a, to an address. This is actually a really important, a really important point here. RDI is not the value um, that we're moving into. We are moving to, we're dereferencing a pointer. The size of a care star is eight bytes. So we actually want to use the entire RDI register as the address. It is a full eight byte address because pointers are eight bytes. In contrast, if I have If I have suffix two that takes a, let's say I do a, uh, an int star PTR and an int val, and I say star PTR equals val, now we can see that I have this move L, but, and I'm moving to RDI, or dereference RDI, because RDI is still a pointer to some location, it's still an eight byte address, but now we are moving from one of those sub-registers. We're moving from ESI, not RSI, because we're moving four bytes. Is that okay? So just one quick note here, one final thing I wanna show you just to reiterate our idea of, of, um, of types, so let me, do this quickly, whoops, I lost it. Um, so if I've got long uh, types, takes long param, and I have the function return the parameter, so this was just what we saw before. Oops, typo. Did it compile? There we go, good, compiled. So here we've got the move queue. Um, and you might say, okay, so so far I said, hey, assembly doesn't have types, it has sizes. And you might say, yeah, well, whatever. I mean, I can see, you know, that's RDI to RAX. It's an eight byte thing, it must be a long. Really? What if it were a long star? Oops. Turns out the code's the same. Right? What if it were an in star? What if I cast hit? Turns out the code's the same. Right? In assembly, we don't have types. We don't have this notion of, you know, oh, this is an int star versus a long star. Hey, what does the cast mean? We're just moving bytes around. We've got this eight byte value in RDI. We've got this eight byte value that we want to write in RAX, and we're just gonna move it. And so, you know, we will not be able to tell just from looking at the assembly whether this was a long star, an int star, whether we had a typecast, whether we didn't. All that information is gone once the C gets compiled down to assembly. So that's something we will revisit 
again, um, today, yeah, so let's, uh, let me wrap up here. Today in, this week in lab is gonna be all about floats, and then we'll come back on Friday and pick up with assembly. I will post the finished GCC Explorer stuff uh, with annotations in the syllabus.